loved ones and we do remember them we do remember them let's pray father we thank you for the sweet memories that we have of the loved ones that have gone on before us they're in your presence they're surrounding your throne and we do sometimes yearn to be there ourselves i pray lord that you would bless those that are mourning their loss of their loved ones right now and as we're praying, Lord, we pray for Dave and his wife as they come and pray for traveling mercies for them as they're on the road with crazy drivers. <laughs> and Lord, for uh, Ron and Nancy as they travel, give them mercies too, and us as we travel. Anyone that's on the road, Lord, we pray for your traveling mercies. We pray for Chris as she's had this operation, Lord, I pray that there's a speedy recovery, that the pain would be less and less each day and that she would be pain-free soon. Think of Steve and his problems too, Lord. I pray that you would touch his knee and give him relief from the pain. Pray for Catherine and Andrew, different issues going on in their life. We pray for them, ask that you would minister to their needs too. And as uh, Bonnie looks after the whole family and puts her life on pause, I pray that you would bless her. May she feel the strength of our prayers today for her. Pray that you'd have your way in our life, Lord. We love you so much. Ask that you would continue to minister to those in need today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. 461. 461. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. <coughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. 
let's pray. Thank you, Lord, this morning for bringing us together and this time of worship. We thank you that we're able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Think about, Lord, the Memorial Day weekend, and uh, we are thankful, Lord, for the lives of the ones uh, who gave their lives uh, so that we could be free today. Those people that didn't come back in times of war, we are truly grateful for. And we thank you, Lord, uh, for the ability to live in this country and uh, be free. Yes. We ask, oh God, that you would continue to bless us. We are a grateful people this morning. And we want to seek to serve you today. Amen. Thank you for what you're doing in each one of our lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Why is it that uh, children don't have to be trained to be bad? <laughs> Never uh, does a child uh, have to be taught how to get angry. Never does a parent have to say, well, don't be so angelic. <laughs> you can have a temper tantrum if you'd like. All of this comes naturally. Misbehavior doesn't have to be stimulated. Why would that be? Well, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3 and uh, maybe uh, give us some sort of an insight. And uh, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, you'd like to read along uh, with me today in chapter 3. Uh, my Bible entitles chapter 3 in Genesis as the fall of man. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will surely die, the serpent said to the woman. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. But God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for the food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Also, she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent uh, deceived me and I ate. Now, obviously there's more to that story, but I think I'm gonna be able to touch on some of the things that I just read to you. You would see that uh, Adam and Eve's uh, immediate response is that they realized that they had sinned. Uh, so they went, and hid. And when God confronted them, they invented a new game, the blame game. And God called out to Abraham, and Abraham said, I heard you coming, but I was afraid and naked, so I hid. So it goes like this. Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent, but excuses don't change the truth. I had a uh, 
professor in college, and when we had a paper due, we would go down through the dates of all the papers that were due, usually for each quarter, there might have been five or six different pages or uh, dates on there that the papers were due, and the professor said, no excuses, none, none whatsoever, because usually an excuse is often a lie. <laughs> that seemed pretty harsh at the time, but you know, after I spent a couple of three years in college, I realized maybe what the professor was saying. And when sin was brought into this perfect paradise in Genesis chapter three, bad things happened. Humanity crossed the line, all because they chose the wrong tree. Did you know that Satan was, is a liar? And there's a, John chapter eight mentions that, that he, he, you know, he's a liar from the beginning. And uh, this is his lie. One can sin and get away with it. But death is a penalty of sin, it tells us in Genesis chapter two and verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And of course, we see it in the lives of those around us, and we also see it in our own life that there is a, like a chain reaction where sin occurs. And the unfortunate thing that happens when we play the blame game is that we blame God for our suffering. Sometimes we blame him for some of the sorrows or the bad things that happen in our lives and also the things that we don't understand while taking credit for anything good that happens. And if we play the blame game often enough, we end up with a distorted view of life that can almost seem like it's normal to us. So normal that we can call good what God calls corrupt, and what God calls good we call distorted. And this is why we need to keep growing in our faith. Uh, it's, you know, continue to improve our serve and, and digging into his word and, and really never stop believing. Even though there are things happening in our lives that would discourage us or cause us not to want to believe. And the Apostle Paul directed in his letter to the Romans, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Now, you may be thinking that you want me to believe the Christian explanation of the fall of Adam and Eve as the reason for human suffering and sin. And to that, I would say, yes, I do. God spoke to the serpent in verses 14 and 15, then he spoke to Eve in verse 16, and he spoke to Adam in verse 17 through 19. And God's word to the serpent included the announcement that the snake crawling and eating dust would be a perpetual reminder to mankind of the temptation and the fall of man and an oracle about the power behind the snake. God said that there would be a perpetual struggle between satanic forces and mankind. He said it would continue to be a struggle up until this day. And it would seem to be between Satan and the woman and their respective offspring or seeds. The offspring of the woman was Cain. And then all humanity at large. And then Christ, and then collectively uh, everyone in Christ, everyone that was in Christ. Now the offspring of the serpent includes demons and anyone serving uh, in the kingdom of darkness. Those whose father is the devil, that John chapter 8 mentions. And Satan would cripple mankind. 
you will strike his heel. But the seed, Christ, would deliver the fatal blow. He will crush your head. Now, I don't think you could find a better explanation in another faith or even in science. Because if the universe is the product of an, of an accidental explosion and human beings are the result of the survival of the fittest, then, then why in the world would people do anything good for one another? See, morality just doesn't make sense. If we were nothing more than evolved animals, wouldn't it make more sense for all the people to be ruthless and, and demonstrate that they're at the top of the food chain? I was listening to a Christian comedian this week and he said, it really, isn't it really interesting? He said, here we all evolved from apes or monkeys. And he said, they stayed the same, but we evolved into a monkey. They, but they stayed the same. <laughs> See, wild animals, they don't feel guilty when they kill. Uh, they simply need to eat. And uh, isn't that how people should really think uh, in a godless world? The fall of Adam and Eve makes more sense in a world that believes in both good and bad. And a sense of morality comes from someone who has morals. <laughs> Adam and Eve crossed the line in the garden, and we've been crossing the line ever since. People get traffic tickets every day. Usually they earn them. People have good reasons for speeding, running red light. They have really good reasons. But good reasons don't excuse the fact that they broke the law. And one of the trademarks of a mature faith is taking responsibility for your actions. And sometimes we do things to ourselves. And if I want to move forward in my faith, I've got to own up to my responsibility. Everybody uh, grows old, but not everyone grows up. And those who don't grow up end up blaming others and never fully understand God, never quite get a grasp of who God is or what he wants to do in their lives. They don't quite understand the Bible, so they don't bother to really get into it and dig in. Nor do they understand really why they're here. And sometimes you see so many people that are stuck in the victim mode. We watched a movie about a girl who was anorexic. And uh, her stepmother ended up uh, taking her to the doctor. Uh, she was at the point of death where they would have to um, put something in her arm in order for her to continue to live. Uh, she went to the rehab and the family come together so, somehow, I guess it's probably pretty even common today that she ended up with uh, three mothers being there. No father was there to represent, and it was a sister. And uh, it just, it ended up in a fiasco. Everybody was blaming everyone else for their, um, oh, I don't know, what would you call it? Dysfunction or problems that they had. But it was really interesting because her turning point was when the doctor displayed some tough love. Things that are hard for us to say, you know, because he, he heard her story and then he heard the entire family's story and just was disgusted in the whole mess. And uh, she had to decide to believe in herself for one thing. And uh, she had to take, uh, come to the point of taking responsibility for her decisions. And, uh, she couldn't make any more excuses because he pressed her into not making excuses that this is your life and you have to make some kind of decision in order to get better. And she could no longer blame uh, other people in her life uh, for her upbringing or her lack of. 
The doctor wouldn't let him. <laughs> and I'm convinced that if you spend enough time convincing yourself that someone else is to blame for your actions, then you'll never keep growing in your faith. And I think one of the uh, trademarks of a fully committed Christian is taking responsibility for your actions. My family history was really interesting. Destructive anger, uh, explosive tempers, uh, repetitive sins. They were in the, the normal of the day. It shattered our family. I, I drug that deep-seated anger and the, those temper eruptions into my adult life. I looked a lot like my family. <laughs> I could verbally unleash at somebody, could use the most foul language that you've ever heard in your life, and justify my actions by simply saying, well, that's just how I grew up. <laughs> I can remember times of doing that. But there was some time into our marriage that the reality set in, and I was just had to come to the conclusion that I was only making excuses, and that I needed somehow to muster up enough strength to be able to take responsibility for my actions. Now, you know, from crossing the line to choosing the wrong tree like Adam and Eve for sin. Maybe some of your own uh, actions will come to mind. If so, you, you may be realizing that you, we need to get honest with God, to take a close look at ourselves, to confess, and just say, I need to take responsibility. And owning our responsibility for our bad choices helps us to grow in our faith. I found that. Imagine the utopia of me. Sometimes we tell ourselves that even though we can't run from our problems, we can solve them if we made everything about us. <laughs> if life were more about me, then everything would be better, we could imagine, and then no one else need to be involved in my life. And see, this is really another characteristic of a distorted view of the world after the fall, when we shifted from God's, a God-centered view to a self-centered view. But well, we think that if we can build the world around ourselves, we can experience paradise once again. But we should know better, because it's, we've got so many things to go back on, especially in the Word of God. And I can't get a bigger life if I'm the biggest thing in my life. I get in the way of myself. It keeps me from seeing anybody else. It keeps me from even thoughts of how could I help someone else. If I've never moved beyond myself, and every time I look, I see myself, and I'm thinking the only one that I should be as concerned in is myself. Remember that in Genesis chapter 1, it says that in the beginning, God, the world didn't and doesn't just start with me or you. It started with God, and it still does. <laughs> we can't find purpose in our life starting with ourselves. See, I'm too small to be the beginning or the end of the center. And the same is true for you. Not only does the universe begin with God, God, it also ends with him. In the, in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and the first and the last and the beginning and the end. So it all begins and ends with God. And I know that we might have a hard time with that. 
But God is first, and we can need, we can either acknowledge that and worship Him, or we can rebel and try to be first ourselves. And in today's world, we could blend in pretty well if we do that. And it leads to the world being judged and destroyed. I remember lots of things that Billy Graham said. And one thing I do remember that he did say more than one time, he said, my heart aches for America. Because he's seen it for what it was. And he's seen what's going on and he's seen the corruption and he, and he's seen the self-centeredness and he's seen the narcissism on the rise of people just caring about themselves and that's it. He knew that. He knew who he was talking to. And didn't, didn't you find it interesting that when he had his crusades that most of the people that came and committed their lives were already Christians, already Christians, already believers, but they never grasped the hold of the fact that it wasn't about them, but it's about God. After the fall, humankind moved further away from God and focused on putting themselves first, and the result was a mess. It was total chaos. But in the midst of this, if you look over in Genesis chapter 6, there was a man named Noah. <laughs> and he put God first. In mm -hmm. Genesis 6 says Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. And Noah had uh, three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jacob. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. And God saw how corrupt the earth had become and for all the people on earth and had corrupted their ways. And God said to Noah, I'm gonna put an end to it all. I'm gonna put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark. And Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. And the whole story of Noah and the ark is about God re rescuing mankind and rescuing the animal world. And God was restoring his creation when everyone except Noah was living for self. And to do this, he had to destroy the world, which is the third major event in the Old Testament. Remember the first major event? God and righteous people in paradise, a perfect world. Everything was great. Everything was wonderful. It was paradise. And then the second major event was Satan and sin enters. Genesis chapter 3 through 5. And then the major, third major event, God judges and destroys the earth in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. How did it come to this? People denied the existence of God, turned their backs on him, made everything all about themselves, that I'm the only one that matters. Think about it. When you acknowledge you have a creator, you bow down to him. It's difficult to justify trying to create your own little utopia where you decide what's right and wrong and you can do whatever you feel is right. Mm. Denying God lets you think that you're in charge. And I'm pretty sure that attitude is evident today. We sometimes live our lives like God doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We just forget the 
just kind of not real mindful of the fact that God's in charge, not real mindful of the fact that he can give us leadership, that he's responsible for everything we have. Make our own plans, draw up our own schedules. We often blame others. But rarely you ever see people taking responsibility for themselves. Mm. That's a rare thing. We look and we see things need to be done. We're happy to let other people do those things that we know that we should be doing. Mm. It's the history of the church. Mm. We ignore the needs of others, mm. which is really really sad and it never crosses our minds to bless someone else oh well, i'm just going to bless someone today just because he blessed me oh. i'd like to challenge you today to put god first that's my challenge, that you would just simply put God first, ahead of your plans. You heard me. <laughs> ahead of your plans and your big ideas, what you want to happen, put God first. Mm. See what happens. Another thing I'd like to challenge you to do is to live every day like it would be your last day on earth. I'd also like to challenge you to invest in someone else's life. Maybe disciple someone, some, take someone under your wing. Maybe pay attention to someone else. Take your mind off yourself and your own needs and your personal circumstances and what you're going through and how, much, how important you think you are to yourself and try to focus on someone else. Mm. I'm going to challenge you to do that. And the last thing I'd like to challenge you is to refuse to blame someone else. Just refuse to blame someone. Just count it out of your mind. Just say, well, just, you know, that, well, how, how does that reflect me? Or how can this take place in my life? And what does it matter? Anyhow, whether somebody else is to blame. Because I, I, would, I would find it really interesting because the people that most likely we do blame are probably not even aware of the fact you're blaming them. <laughs> and not just that, and I know in my own life, if I was to blame my family, well, they're all dead. <laughs> How can I do that? So that wouldn't do much good. But I'd like you to challenge you to do those few things that I asked today. Continue to read Genesis. It's a really good book. I think there's a lot in it for us, a lot in it that, that kind of displays things that happened in history that are, there's some answers for today. Some answers that we can give to others of when they start saying, well, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, I'll tell you why. Just go back to the book of Genesis. All you have to do is just simply read. You don't have to be real coherent in your read, but you, you do have to understand just how to read some things. And the answers are really there, aren't they? Yes. It's so simple. But yet we seem to overlook things. I do. I, I just challenge you today that you would just look for somebody that you could bless. Mm. Because I'm going to remind you, it's not about us. Mm -hmm. It's always about other people. That's what Christianity is. Jesus came so that others could live. Jesus came so that I could have life. Jesus came to deliver me from my sin so that I could help somebody in some steps to eternal life. That's why he came. So it comes to, down to the point where it's all about others. It's always been about others. It's never been a social thing. It's never been 
uh, like a country club. Like when I was growing up, I was a member of different clubs and you'd go in and you would be there for the entertainment and you would be there to see someone else and you might look at somebody else's clothes or whatever and they might comment on that or whatever. Or when I was a member of a gun club, they might come comment on your guns or whatever. Or when I did archery, they might comment on the, your bow or something like that. But this, uh, the church isn't a club. Yeah. The church is a place where we come together to put our brains together and think, how can we touch other people's lives? Yeah. How could that happen? Yeah. And what would the church look like? If that happened, that we would place the focus away from ourselves and place other people in the center of our focus. Mm. So that when we do look at situations in our life that we have no control over, or when we're looking at situations in other people's lives that they have no control over, at least we could know that we have some answers for them to give them some answers, some stability in their life. And more than anything else, I don't know what brought you to Christ, but it was the people that I could see cared about other people's lives. That they would just simply put other people first. And they were always about helping someone else, always going here and there and doing things about touching other people's lives and making a difference in other people's lives. But isn't that just why we're here? Isn't that the reason why so many people just can't figure it all out? Why am I here? I pray that we could all get the answer to that. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, this morning for this uh, book of Genesis and the different things that happened in uh, other people's lives that we can reflect on. We know for a fact, Lord, that when we get into the Word, the Word sets us free. And we love and appreciate what you're doing in our life just now and the different things you're showing us, especially in how to touch other people's lives. We pray, O oh God, that you would have your way in our lives as we seek to know you. And I thank you, Lord, that you've given us the, the opportunity to touch others that you would uh, show us today, Lord, who we're supposed to be encouraging and how we're able to lift others up and how we're able to put people first in our lives rather than ourselves. Thank you for being so good to us. And boy, we just love and appreciate when you show us things in your word. It does us some good and it helps us to thank him. We thank you again for the anointing that you'll give us in order to do the things that we know we should be doing. We can't do it on our own. We need your help. We need every bit of strength that you can give us spiritually and physically and mentally. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in our last song today.
you, Father, for today, for being here and blessing us with your word. Guide us and direct us, Lord. Dismiss us in your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.